And now we're going to have a discussion about the crypto wars, which is this ongoing conflict about the fact that some governments seem to be very insistent on not allowing people to encrypt their data. But luckily, there's some people fighting against them, and among them, there's the Electronic, Front, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Which apparently also dabbles in publishing. I don't know if you noticed, there's, they released a book, a science fiction collection recently. It's really strange. But it's a very good collection. You should read it. And now, please welcome Kurt Opsal from the EFF. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It is, uh, my name is Kurt Opsal. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here at CCC, and thank you all for, for coming. I know it's a little early in the day, so I'm, thank you for making the effort to come here. Today we're going to talk about the crypto wars, uh, what we call part two. Uh, the crypto wars part one was about uh, 20 years ago, and now it's back. Uh, so we fought pretty hard uh, back then against attempts to limit, suppress, and cripple encryption. Uh, my organization, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, was on the front lines uh, fighting throughout the 90s to help preserve uh, the ability for people to use, develop, and publish strong encryption. It was a long struggle, took many years, uh, but finally, by, by the end of the 90s, uh, encryption prevailed, and we thought at least for a time uh, we would have the freedom to continue to use as strong as encryption as we possibly could. But now, the governments are at it again. They come back to try and weaken or destroy crypto, make it harder to use. Uh, so today we're going to talk about a little bit of the history, uh, going back to, uh, against the original crypto wars, a little bit about what governments are now doing to try and reignite those wars, and then some of the, uh, the arguments that you can make to help fight back uh, and preserve your access to strong encryption. So we'll start with a bit of the background. Uh, you know, for, in the earlier times, you know, through the Cold War, even before, uh, encryption was generally considered to be a military technology. Not always. I mean, uh, there was actually a commercial version of the Enigma machine uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, but by and large, uh, it was used most commonly in the military and thought of as a military technology. By about the, the 70s, uh, they came out with a standard of uh, the data encryption standard, DES. Uh, and this started to uh, popularize encryption. It started to be used more frequently. Uh, it also uh, uh, sort of helped jumpstart some of the fields of crypto analysis. There was an algorithm that people could start to look at and, and intensely try to see if there were flaws. Uh, it turned out there were some flaws, but we didn't find that out till, till later. Uh, in the late 70s, uh, RSA uh, found a way to implement the uh, Diffie-Hellman public key exchange. This was a great advance in, in technology, allowing people to send encrypted communications when they weren't uh, able to uh, uh, have a side channel to exchange the key. Uh, this was very important in the development of cryptography. Uh, by the early 90s, uh, we had the Pretty Good Privacy and Email Encryption program that most of you are probably familiar with, uh, allowing people to have end-to-end -end encrypted email communications. Uh, and by the mid-90s, we had uh, secured socket layer introduced by the Netscape for its uh, navigator browser program, allowing servers to communicate with encryption and authentication uh, between the server and the browser. Uh, but this presented some, some challenges, and uh, one of those challenges was what is, what is a munition? So I have up on the screen two types of munitions. On the right, a more familiar one, the tank. Uh, which has export controls, and many people would find that sensible that before you're going to ship a tank to people, you should uh, know, know what you're doing. Uh, and on the, on the left, we have the Netscape Navigator. Uh, this is the, uh, the international version approved for uh, export. And at the time, uh, the standard for encryption was 128-bit uh, secured socket layer. Uh, for the domestic version, while the international, the export version, was limited to 40-bit uh, uh, encryption, 
which turns out could be, uh, could be broken in days. And the idea behind this limitation was in part to make sure that organizations like the, uh, the NSA could easily break the encryption, that we weren't exporting something that couldn't be broken by our security services. But this, this created some sort of you know, relative uh, craziness that uh, uh, encryption that was developed overseas could be stronger. Uh, cryptography conferences started to be held in places like Caribbean islands to uh, get around these encryption. And there were some legal challenges to these uh, export uh, regulations. Now, one of the legacies that came out of these uh, uh, export grade encryption, we just saw actually um, this year uh, illustrated through the freak and long jam attacks. Uh, I'm going to talk about this very briefly. There was actually a great session uh, yesterday uh, from Alex Halderman and Nadia Hedinger. To go through them in great detail, I suggest you, you watch that if you haven't already. Uh, but the, the takeaway from this for, uh, for the crypto wars was that the legacy of export-grade encryption uh, persisted 20 years later so that people were able to convince uh, browsers and servers to downgrade to the export-grade keys which were designed uh, to allow the NSA to be able to break them. Uh, but it didn't really have the foresight to think about how much computing power would change over the years. So perhaps uh, in the 1990s when they were trying to come up with these uh, export grade levels, uh, they thought that, well, only, only the NSA would have the computing power to do this, and so uh, this was a wise idea. But it turned out not to be a very wise idea 20 years later when you can go on to uh, Amazon and for uh, $75 and a couple hours of time be able to break some of these uh, export grade encryptions. So we're still having some casualties from the first uh, crypto wars today. During the 90s, there, we had a challenge. Uh, Dan Bernstein uh, challenged export control of his uh, Snuffle crypto program. Uh, this was a case that the EFF helped and uh, uh, took it to the courts uh, and had some success. Uh, the, the courts determined that uh, code was speech, that this was a free expression protected act that you could publish your, uh, the source code, you could publish your algorithms, and that this shouldn't be treated uh, as, as a munition, but rather thought of as speech. And out of the, uh, the appeal from that case, we had a great quote that, that came from the court showing that the courts were recognizing both the freedom of expression rights here, but also uh, the privacy value that uh, they recognize that the availability of strong encryption would help people protect their privacy, implicating not only First Amendment rights, but they're thinking about the right to receive information as recipients of encryption's bounty. So this was a, a very strong blow that helped uh, enable encryption moving forward. Another legacy of the 90s was the Clipper chip. Uh, this was a, a chipset. Uh, it was designed for voice communications to encrypt voice communications with the skipjack uh, encryption algorithm, and then it included a back door with a, uh, a key that was supposed to be placed in escrow so that when the government came knocking, they could get the escrowed key, decrypt the communications, and find out what people said, and they wanted to have people install this chip uh, on all their phones. And as we and many others pointed out to them, back doors can be very dangerous. Even a small flaw in a crypto system can ultimately end up being disastrous. And as it turned out, the Clipper chip did have some flaws. Uh, by the uh, 1994, Matt Blaze was able to uh, determine that the uh, law enforcement access field contained the information needed to recover the key. Uh, so this made the, the key escrow not just a backdoor for the NSA, but a backdoor to, for other people to access as well. Um, there was later an attack that was able to bypass the escrow. Uh, so Clipper ended up being widely condemned and eventually uh, was uh, uh, sort of universally considered to be a bad idea. So, when we look back over the 1990s uh, policy debate, it's actually very eerily similar to today. A lot of the same talking points are being used, uh, a lot of the same arguments. Um, 
for example, and there are actually many examples, I'm just going to pick a few. Um, but uh, in 1997, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation said, yeah, strong encryption, it's, it's great, we love it. Uh, we just want to make sure that there's a, a key that's available so that we can get access to it. Uh, fast forward to the 2000s, and the FBI's general counsel says, yeah, great, strong encryption, uh, but they just need to be able to find a way to give us the, the plain text. So we're considering you know, the sort of same rhetoric that uh, they, they realize that perhaps saying we want weak encryption doesn't sound right, people are, people are not receptive to that. So they say, great, strong encryption, we're all for it, it just has to have a giant hole in it. Um, so what happened in, in, the, in the 2010s that, that brought this, uh, the second round of the crypto wars? Why did, why did the government sort of start attacking encryption again? The major shift is the development of widespread encryption. Uh, I mean, the, the key event that really started off uh, government rhetoric came around the time that, that first Apple and shortly thereafter Google said that they were going to have encryption on their phones for the, for the data stored on the phone uh, that they couldn't unlock at the government's request. So, for example, with iOS 7 and before, uh, it had encryption on there, but if you sent the phone into Apple and, uh, you know, brought a warrant and, and such, they, uh, Apple could... Uh, unlock the phone, get access to the information, and they said, well, with the new uh, iOS 8 and later, they wouldn't be able to do that, that the, uh, only the user would be able to unlock their, their phones. Uh, at the same time, more and more commonplace messaging apps started to have encryption. Uh, iMessage was one of the early things, actually since the beginning of iMessage, it had opportunistic encryption, so if it was a, uh, a text sent from an iPhone to an iPhone, it would use iMessage and encrypt the, the message. Uh, there also became, uh, Text Secure became popularized for Android, WhatsApp, uh, one of the most popular communication tools out there with uh, uh, at least a billion users. Uh, it started out being uh, unencrypted, but uh, has started to work with uh, Open Whisper systems to add encryption and encrypt communications of billions of users. And this is bringing about more ubiquitous encryption. So things that had previously been limited to more technically sophisticated users, relatively rare, something that when you, know, when you look at some of the Snowden documents, they talk about encryption being used as a flag to say, well, this is interesting because it's encrypted. Uh, or they say, you know, we will store encrypted communications until such time as we're able to decrypt them. Uh, but as more and more communications were encrypted, where it was becoming less unusual, less rare, this started to become something very worrisome uh, for the government. So it started out, as, uh, as I said, from the announcements of having a strong encryption without the ability for companies to unlock for mobile phones, uh, though the conversation quickly moved to talking about end-to-end -end encryption as a problem. Uh, the uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Cameron, asked rhetorically, are we going to allow a means of communication which simply isn't possible to read? And his answer, of course, was, was no, not if he has his way. He doesn't want there to be a private space where you can communicate without having the government able to look over your shoulder. There should be no place to hide. So they started to strike back. And using some of the tools that we remember from the first crypto wars, uh, public and private pressure on the companies who were supplying these technologies, public rhetoric to try and demonize encryption, make it look bad for the public, uh, and then by changing that atmosphere, try and create a more ripe situation for legislation. Uh, and of course, at the same time, the, uh, the NSA, the GCHQ, uh, intelligence agencies are working to use technical attacks to try to weaken or defeat encryption. So a lot of the public pressure is on the, I mean, you know, the FBI director uh, asks, uh, you know, why would you market something to allow people to place themselves beyond the law? And this is sort of a way of twisting the conversation, uh, you know, not asking, you know, why would someone want to have something that would protect uh, people from oppressive regimes or would it give them a private space or allow for uh, secure e-commerce, but sort of discussing this as something that is only purpose is to enable criminal activities. And Cameron putting the pressure on, saying that companies have a responsibility to fight
fight terrorism. And if they, you know, if they care, if they're patriotic, they will do as I say and put in these back doors, put in these government's uh, ability. And they're doing this also in part to focus on the companies with large user bases. I was saying before, uh, the thing that has really scared the governments is sort of the widespread by default availability of encryption. So they're trying to get that switched off for the large companies, relegating encryption back to a relatively rare thing that can be used for, for targeting. They're also trying to be dismissive of, of the companies, uh, saying, you know, well, it's only a business model. It's, uh, it's not a technical feature, it is a marketing pitch. Uh, well, in some sense, you know, that, 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 I, I think that's great. Mar it, strong encryption should be a marketing pitch, should be a reason why you're uh, providing, uh, providing the product to a willing audience. But it is more than that. It's also something of principle, and they're trying to remove the principle and try and uh, dismiss the companies as being only profit motivated. Um, so there have been uh, uh, what they call some proposals for secure backdoors, and this seems like a contradiction in terms or a misnomer, uh, but nevertheless there have been a lot of proposals out there. The most common is key escrow, this notion that you have a, a message that is sent with a symmetric key, you encrypt that key twice, once to the recipient so they can decrypt it and read it, the escrow agent gets a copy that is stored so that uh, at some point later, if they want to get it, they can get it from the escrow, use that key, read the message. Uh, but this has a number of, of problems. Uh, if the escrow agent's private key is compromised, it breaks the whole system. They, someone will be able to use that key to go back and get messages uh, for, uh, well, as many people as that key can, can unlock. So it creates a, a point of failure um, and then if you're using a, a single uh, escrow, this can break forward secrecy, a property that is very useful for creating strong encryption. It's a recommended property that I think we want to have uh, as widespread as possible. But if the whole design is to allow it so that somebody at any point can get the escrow key, go back and read all the messages of the past, this is sort of defeating the point of uh, forward secrecy. Now, you can mitigate some of these things. Some proposals have talked about uh, split keys, uh, so that you might have to get more than one key in order to uh, get it from the escrow agent. And you know, this, this adds uh, some uh, mitigation, so that you have to get, uh, compromise a couple of different places to move forward. But all of these things add complexity, and complexity is the enemy of security. For every complexity you're adding, you're making a larger attack surface, you're creating additional possibilities for vulnerabilities. Also, with any case of, a, of an escrow agent, uh, you have some questions to rise. Who would be that escrow? Would the government be an escrow? Uh, then if so, how do you pick which government or which government gets access to the escrow? Should the provider be the escrow? Uh, should we have a, a trusted third party? And for any of the escrows, they're often not in a position to raise the important concerns that we might want to be, have handled. For example, if we've decided that certain communications are privileged, like an attorney-client communication, none of these escrows are in a position to know that this is a privileged communication, to raise that concern and uh, uh, failed, you know, resist providing it, challenge the acquisition. Um, if you have an escrow, you also introduce uh, insider risk, the possibility that someone who's working at the escrow agent, is familiar with its practices, can do something that would make it appear like they have a legitimate request that has come through the proper channels, and then use that to, to gain access to the uh, uh, previously private communications. And we have a bit of a history to look back on on why this can be problematic uh, with law enforcement access points. So there have been uh, a number of attacks on law enforcement access points. Uh, some uh, they become a tempting target for criminals, for state-sponsored attackers. Uh, we look at the example of the Greek uh, wiretapping scandal, where it was a law enforcement access point where, uh, that once you get access to the access point, you can use its properties and its permissions to get a much wider access. Similarly, uh, China attacked Google's law enforcement access point, using that to get information about dissidents. Um, and so 
if you create an escrow agent, if you create a method for law enforcement to get access to it, you create a very tempting target that will be certainly in the sights of any attackers. So a lot of these arguments have been raised, and what we heard back from, from some people in the policymaker things is, okay, we see that you have a problem with back doors. Um, maybe we should just rename it. So we don't want a back door, we want a front door. Uh, or you know, sometimes people have talked about a side door or a trap door. Uh, and this, this is very sort of uh, uh, typical of uh, uh, politicians, is that you know, the, the, the problem is the rhetoric, the name uh, that we can, you know, uh, the Washington Post uh, also is saying, well, we understand that a back door can be uh, exploited by bad guys, so instead, how about a secure golden key? Um, and you know, this, this was widely, uh, widely criticized and ridiculed as, as it should have been, uh, but it reflects an, an attitude of, uh, we'll just uh, say what we want, which is something magical, a secure golden key, and then toss the problem back to technologists to try to solve and maybe even legislate so they have to solve it. Uh, and sort of reflecting an attitude that this is all, you know, they use the term wizardry, it is magical wizardry that people can do and come up with magical solutions. So while this is going on, it was still, uh, they're, they're having some troubles that, uh, you know, these proposals were, were ridiculed. Cool. There were a lot of people who were pointing out the many flaws with, with back doors, uh, but uh, they're, they're, they ha held out uh, an interesting hope, and this is uh, a quote from the general counsel of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the uh, uh, oversight uh, agency that uh, uh, looks over the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, and it was noting, well, what if there was a terrorist attack or criminal event that could be shown to have where encryption had hindered law enforcement? That's the real thing that we need to to turn this discussion around. So. Uh, well, we had a number of, of, uh, of attacks in this last term, tragic attacks. Um, and, but what, what do you do if, if you have these things but uh, crypto wasn't involved? Well, you suggest that it was anyway. Uh, so we have the, uh, the prescient comment here from Michael Morell, the former uh, CIA deputy director. We don't know anything, but I bet you the encryption was involved. And then he proceeded to talk about how, how encryption was very, uh, very dangerous. So after following the, the attacks in Paris, the attacks in San Bernardino, there were a lot of talking heads who were going on the television shows, the uh, uh, public policy debates, and trying to say that encryption was in fault, when in fact uh, the Paris attackers used plain text, uh, uh, text messages, uh, the San Bernardino attackers, actually mostly they communicated just directly in person, uh, but uh, they, they also used some direct messages uh, that were not encrypted. And they're also trying to take this time to demonize encryption, to try and uh, get people with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, the Home Secretary May brings up what, what uh, back in the 90s we had called the you know, four horsemen of the infopocalypse, uh, talking about child pornographers, crime, drugs, terrorists. Uh, the Senator Feinstein, who is on the uh, U.S. Intelligence Committee, went even a little further basically saying that encryption will be used to behead children, uh, which, you know, I, I think this is uh, taking it a little far, a little far. Uh, so with this, in this atmosphere, we're starting to see some proposals come out of many countries to try to limit encryption. Sometimes, too, they're talking about mandating a back door, sometimes mandating access to plain text without sort of specifying the, the manner of the access, or putting laws that would help endanger encryption. Uh, probably the most prominent of these right now is what's known as the uh, Snoopers Charter, the Investigatory Powers Act out of the United Kingdom. Uh, now this is a, a, an interesting proposal because it is not just aimed at uh, telecommunication companies in the United Kingdom, it purports to regulate companies all over the world. 
Uh, now, this raises some questions. You know, if you were, uh, had a company who did no business in the United Kingdom, you were completely separate from it, you know, how would they be able to enforce that? But for a large company that has offices all over the world, many of them will have offices or people on the ground within the UK that will be subject to the UK's distinction, jurisdiction, and this can be a, a tool that the UK can use to try and enforce this against them. Uh, and it's a long bill, it has 299 pages, a lot of detail, there's actually a lot of problems with the bill beyond the encryption issue, but today we want to focus on that. And in section 189, they have a provision dealing with electronic protection. This is a term which we believe they, they mean uh, encryption. Um, and it is saying that if the provider put on the electronic protection, it may be obligated to take it off. Now, um, this could be interpreted a, a variety of ways. It will be interesting to see how it eventually gets interpreted. Uh, but it could be interpreted to require weakened encryption, holding a key, uh, banning end-to-end -end encryption if it is not possible to do this. Uh, and one of the things that, that's interesting about it, so it has a, a, some language there saying that uh, only if it's uh, practicable only if it's you know, feasible, reasonable to do this, but this is done in the home secretary's determination. So it won't be the technologist that would be able to determine whether it was practical to be able to remove the encryption, but rather the home secretary say, I, I think that's practical, and so now you're obligated to do that. So the latest version of the Investigatory Powers Act came out in November. It is currently before a committee in the UK Parliament, which is accepting comments right now. Uh, a number of organizations, EFF and many other civil society organizations have submitted comment. A lot of industry have submitted comments. Uh, Apple, uh, in particular, made some news with its comments with a strong uh, defense of, of privacy and a warning against back doors, saying that a key left under the doormat would not just be there for the good guys, but recognizing that the bad guys would find it too. There have been a couple other interesting ones uh, around the world. Uh, Australia has a Defense Trade Controls Act uh, that has some interesting language talking about the intangible supply. So, uh, you know, th this is a, a, a you know, Munitions Control Act, an Export Control. Um, and, you know, it's pretty obvious when you are supplying a tank, whether, you know, you supply it or not is not very uh, uh, hard to figure out. But when you're talking about encryption, it gets a little bit weird because, uh, you know, are, what if you explain the algorithm to somebody? What if you show them a copy of the algorithm? Is that exporting? Is that supplying the technology? Um, the Department of Defense in Australia has suggested that merely explaining an algorithm could be intangible supply come within the zone of this act. Um, now, it remains to be seen whether that interpretation will be, will be upheld in the, in the courts, but what this means is that there is a, uh, a threat, a possibility that somebody who's doing ordinary teaching and research activities could be subject to these controls with very severe penalties, and that provides a chilling effect for people trying to do things which are very important for our security by doing the research, doing the teaching. Uh, so a lot of people uh, uh, have signed a petition against hundreds of experts, have explained why this is a very, very bad idea. India also came out uh, this September with a uh, draft national encryption policy. Uh, this was a, a sort of particularly bad one. Uh, it said that everyone was required to store a plain text copy of their encrypted messages, keep that around, and then be able to hand it over upon request. This was widely condemned and, and ridiculed, and eventually uh, India withdrew this. Uh, they're going to go back to the drawing boards, but we'll have to keep an eye out to see what they come up with next. Uh, very recently, actually on Sunday uh, of, uh, uh, I guess, four days ago, uh, China passed a new uh, anti-terrorism law. Uh, in a draft version, there was a provision that would require uh, technology companies to hand over their encryption codes. The final version did remove that, but it still contains some very dangerous language saying that the companies are required to provide technical interfaces, decryption, and other technical support. So again, this could be uh, interpreted to mean that they have to find a way to be able to decrypt it, which means having some weakness, some backdoor, some additional key that would enable them to do so. 
Uh, and one of the things that actually also came out from China's anti-terrorism law is that uh, when discussing it, they were pointing to other countries who have put in or propose similar things. So that uh, uh, in, when, when the uh, governments around the world put forward proposals to create backdoors, to, to uh, suggest that encryption is a problem and they mean it, say, well, we're trying to make it so that it's, it's safe for you know, Western uh, democracy. Uh, at the same time, regimes which uh, are, are uh, much more totalitarian can use the same language, use the same rhetoric to justify their own attacks and their own uh, attempts to make it so people can't have secure and private communications. Uh, in the United States, there is not yet uh, a legislation uh, to mandate backdoors and mandate access to encryption. Uh, President Obama has said that he will not, for now, call for this legislation. Uh, this, this for now is, is somewhat worrisome. Um, we uh, organized with, with several other uh, civil society groups a petition uh, asking him to uh, support strong encryption uh, after he had put out this for now statement to make a more clear statement that they would put that aside and say that no, they weren't going to ask for backdoors, not just for now, but but forever, uh, and uh, we have not get, yet gotten the, the full response to that, so uh, hopefully that will come soon and, and it will be a, a clearer statement. But right now, we're sort of in a, in a waiting game to see whether it will go forward, and the rumor has it that the Senate Intelligence Committee is going to be proposing a bill in the coming spring. Now, if they do propose it, of course, we will fight against that bill, try and make sure that it doesn't get passed, and if it gets passed, move to uh, get it thrown out in the courts as, as unconstitutional. Uh, I want to take a brief moment to talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is an international uh, trade agreement that has been negotiated, is now being uh, uh, considered, and some uh, people looked through this uh, lengthy agreement once it became public and noted that there was a little bit on encryption and there was a, a question, well, was there actually some good news in this? Otherwise, the TPP is fairly terrible. Um, and it turns out, in the final analysis, no. There was a provision in there, or is a provision, in there, saying that a provider may not be compelled to give a key, uh, but only as a condition of sale. So it's silent as to whether they could be compelled to give a key under other conditions. And there's also a provision in there that said that the provider can be uh, required to give decrypted content, which still has a lot of the same problems that uh, uh, we, have been, we have been fighting against. So at the same time as this legislation is going on, the public policy debates uh, in the background, there are also uh, technical attempts to try and reduce the effectiveness of encryption, make it harder to use, harder to use securely. Uh, one of the more prominent ones that came out of the uh, Snowden documents, there was routing around encryption. We have here the illustration uh, where they looked at the uh, communications between data centers uh, where Google added and removed SSL at a particular point and they were able to get in there and get the unencrypted communications. Now when that came out, uh, this caused uh, uh, Google and, and many other companies to beef up their encryption and encrypt between the data centers, but this is still, people are still looking for it, and you can rest assured that uh, the uh, intelligence agencies are trying to find places where they can just go, find a gap in encryption, and get the information there. They're also working on breaking encryption, inserting vulnerabilities, and putting in malware. Go through a couple of these. One is there's, we know from the Snowden documents about the Bull Run program, uh, $250 million a year budget to insert vulnerabilities, to influence policies, participate in uh, cryptography discussions, to try to weaken it and influence the standards that are being used. Uh, and we saw a, uh, a, an example of that uh, with the RSA's use of the dual EC DRBG uh, encryption standard or the random number generator. Uh, this had a flaw uh, that if there was a, uh, I'm, I'm only going to go over the technology of this very briefly, we don't have much time, but there was a, a constant Q that if you, if you knew what it was, if you uh, made it uh, uh, special, would operate to significantly reduce the complexity of attack and basically be able to backdoor the random number generator and therefore be able to uh, 
uh, more easily get access to encryption. Um, and the NSA paid RSA $10 million to make it the default. Um, and we had, uh, so this was known to have a potential uh, backdoor as early as 2007, uh, after some of the Snowden documents came out, after we got some reports about the $10 million payment, people looked at it very deeply uh, and showed how it could be used and proved that it could be used for this backdoor. But very recently, we actually got a, uh, an interesting example of this backdoor in operation. But it's a very curious case. So uh, Juniper uses an operating system for some of its routing software that used this uh, dual EC uh, program. But it didn't use the, the queue that had been suggested by the NSA. Uh, they used a new and alternative queue. So perhaps this means that, you know, that there was a backdoor, but, but they changed the locks. Um, and in addition, the output from dual EC was passed through a second, stronger random number uh, generator, which you, know, you, you may uh, uh, have made it so that uh, it, was, it was not a big deal that uh, it would be put through the stronger one and, and made, made as strong as that. However, people discovered by looking at the, at the code that there was uh, a portion that was looking at the raw output, which is the, the purpose of which would give them these 32 bytes that would be necessary in order to passively uh, break VPN. Um, and in addition, there was a second flaw that came out was that somebody had hard-coded a password uh, for SSH and Telnet into the program. These look to be perhaps different attacks. They're, they're, one is good for passive collection of VPN, the other is good for going in and owning a, a particular uh, router. But what is very curious about this is uh, what, what exactly happened here. It seems like someone came in, took advantage of the backdoor that the NSA had created through the dual EC, and used it for their own devices. This is illustrating what are the great dangers of putting in a backdoor. They depend on the notion that only you will be able to use this backdoor, that you'll have the key, keep others out, and have access for yourself. And yet what we see here is an example where someone was able to switch out the locks, create a new key, and create their own backdoor that would be dependent on this infrastructure that had been maintained. Finally, malware. Malware continues to be uh, uh, a way to route around uh, encryption. If you control the endpoint, you can go ahead and look at the, the plain text. You can use a keylogger to get people's passwords. You can uh, basically avoid the encryption so they can think that they're having end-to-end -end encryption, but of course, only, uh, it's only good if the end isn't compromised. Uh, and this is, this is a tool that is more oriented towards targeted attacks, while the other tools, like passively looking at VPN, more oriented towards mass attacks. All right, so how do we fight back? What are the, what are the arguments we can raise? What can we say to policymakers? What can we do to fight against this? Well, we can rely on arguments with principle, with public policy, with pragmatism, and with promotion. With principle, just have to explain to people that strong encryption is required to effectuate human rights principles, that we need it for privacy, that we need it for free expression, that encryption is going to help us bring a brighter future. You can look to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which uh, enshrines within it the notion that people should have the privacy free from arbitrary interference. Uh, the principle from Article 19, uh, free expression, that people have the right to free expression, and that right includes the ability to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media. And in order to effectuate that right to receive and impart information and ideas, we need to have encryption. We need, like any media should include encryption, and you should be able to include within those ideas encryption. And this is also the notion that code is speech. Code is an aspect of freedom of expression, that if we are going to have these rights as important human right principle, then it must allow for the publication of strong end and crypto systems. And I think this especially comes uh, uh, true for open source systems, where people are putting out and publishing things for the world to see because they want 
the world to look at their crypto systems, see what the problems might be, find vulnerabilities, report them back, those things can be improved, and be part of the ongoing dialogue. And this requires having uh, the freedom of publication, the freedom of discussion, and having people come together at places like CCC to discuss, debate, and improve on the crypto systems. And I think the other important human right principle that needs to be recognized is that protecting against oppressive regimes is more important than maximizing spying. That we have a, a greater role in trying to protect people, give them the, the freedom to organize, to talk amongst themselves, to have a private space, to effectuate their uh, democracy, rather than uh, increasing and maximizing the power of the state. Thank you. So weakening encryption is actually, it's mostly good for mass untargeted spying. Things like uh, where, where it is, uh, if they have targeted spying, they can use tools like malware, target attacks, uh, tailored access, uh, and go after a particular target. But when you're going after an entire crypto system, what is the purpose of that? And the purpose is to enable mass decryption of mass communications so you control through it and look for subversive elements, look for keywords. Um, and mass spying is less effective and more invasive. So one of the reasons we have to hold a line on having strong encryption is at least to require a security state to have to have a reason to go after people, have to put into some effort and make it sure that they're only targeting where they have the strongest it's most necessary to the, uh, to the reasons they're looking for. Um, we also want to have strong encryption so that we can have a, a feeling of the, the strength coming from looking at the math, looking at uh, how the crypto system works, having that tested by our best crypto analysis so that we can say it's not just a black box that we put something in there, trust that it works okay, and then uh, hope for the best. And the thing is, you can't combine that with, with backdoors, because if you're, if you're putting in a, a backdoored system, you don't know all the ways in which it works out. If you have something like the, the Clipper chip, uh, it, was a, it was a black box for the first uh, three or four years that it was available. They weren't showing the algorithm. It was just, trust us, we've done this well. Instead, we want strong encryption, which can be looked at, tested, and understood, so we can trust the math. Also, we want strong encryption because it enables innovation. Since uh, we, we had the first crypto wars, uh, the availability of strong encryption has been tremendously useful. Uh, the e-commerce that we use day to day, it was enabled by the ability to have encrypted communications, authenticated communications between servers and browsers. Uh, strong encryption and the availability of it have come with innovations like Bitcoin. The possibility of a, a cryptocurrency uh, depends on the availability of strong encryption. And after having that be a theoretical possibility for many years, we have uh, found in Bitcoin a real world example of some innovation relying upon strong encryption. And if we go ahead and try to force the companies to compromise on security, this makes everybody less safe. Uh, that encryption is critical for security. So oftentimes, the policymakers, when they're trying to argue encrypt against encryption, they're making an appeal to national security. We need to have weak encryption for security. This is a false debate. This is, there's not a trade-off between uh, security and encryption. Security is vital, uh, sorry, encryption is vital for security. At the same time, if you say, all right, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we still, we wanna have um, this back door. If you put aside the arguments about it, and even if you think that a, a back door is a good idea, it's still, you have to address the other question, who do you give the back door to? So even if you think your own government is the best, most honorable government in the world, and they will surely only use this for, for uh, happiness and, and good, uh, at the same time, 
well, what about the other governments? And when you say that we get to have a backdoor for, for these communications, then the other governments, the ones that you might not like, the ones you might find to be a repressive regime, they're going to ask for a backdoor too. Uh, and then who gets to have it? How do we have a, a principled discussion about that? And we saw this, as we were just saying, in the Chinese anti-terrorism law, where they're using, uh, citing to uh, some of these language and, and rhetoric to say, well, we're just doing what other countries are doing. I think another public policy thing, you hear going dark is a big thing that, that uh, you'll, you'll hear from, from governments say, when encryption is making us going dark. And this, this is just not recognizing that we're actually in a golden age of surveillance. That right now you have cameras on so many street corners, people are carrying around a location tracker, a mobile phone in their pockets at all times, everything they do, making credit card purchases, having uh, e even encrypted communications or providing tons of metadata that is being trolled and analyzed. It is, is easy for governments to conduct surveillance as it has ever been, and yet they want to say that they're going dark just to add this extra element so they can try and get the encrypted communications. We can also argue about pragmatism. Well, as I mean, one argument, it won't work. And this is true as far as it goes, uh, that uh, when you if, you, if you try to ban encryption, you're trying to say that you can't have strong encryption, uh, what are you going to do about an open source project? If you mandate that it has a, a backdoor, someone might compile it without that backdoor. Um, and free software is hard to stop, and even if you make it hard to publish in certain jurisdictions, uh, information wants to be free, it will fi find a way out there. This is good as far as it goes, though, as we were saying before, the governments uh, are, are mostly concerned with widespread availability of encryption, so that it's only so good to have encryption available with people with a technical sophistication enough to compile their own code. Uh, we can also argue on a pragmatic level about math, that it's just simply not possible to make encryption simultaneously weak and strong. And finally, if the argument is about national security, about terrorists, all these efforts to weaken encryption uh, will mostly affect law-abiding people. It's not going to stop terrorists from being able to use these tools. So what can you do about it? Well, you can help by promoting creating, improving, and using encryption. Um, show your friends how to use encryption. Thank you. Go to Make it as widespread as possible. You know how to use it. I think probably most people in this room have used encryption many, many times, but you might have some friends who are new to this. Show them how to use it. Show them how to operate a secure messenger. Uh, show them how to install Tor. Uh, EFF has a uh, program, Surveillance Self-Defense, ssd.eff.org. It has tools to show people how to defend themselves. Uh, and for those of you who are programmers who are working on some of these projects, try to make censorship-resistant crypto tools. Make them open source. Make the, uh, the dis distribution as wide as possible so that it will be difficult to take back and put that genie back in the bottle. Use reproducible builds so that someone who uh, downs load it will know that they are getting and compiling the thing that you have shown them with the open source to have strong encryption. Uh, I'll just talk briefly about some of the efforts that uh, EFF is working on to try and help with the widespread adoption of encryption. Uh, you heard earlier in CCC, I hope some of you went to it, there was a talk about Let's Encrypt. This is a new certificate authority that tries to make it easy and fun to add SSL to every uh, website, to add uh, transport layer security, so that there's no more excuse for having an unencrypted website. We also have been uh, looking at rating uh, big providers on how well they are working at uh, encrypting the web. So we have the Encrypt the Web report. There's a screenshot of it there. You can see a number of companies have uh, gotten five out of five. This is in part a reaction to that uh, smiley face we saw on the slide earlier, where they were putting in stronger encryptions in reaction to the student document, and we're continuing to put pressure on all the large providers to massively increase their use of strong encryption. 
Uh, we also have the secure messaging uh, scorecard, uh, which goes through, I think it's about 30 or 40 different messaging tools and provides some information about what kind of encryption they use uh, with a checkbox system. So if you want to find out what messaging systems are using encryption and how much they're using, go check it out, the secure messaging scorecard, and try to add and start using as many encryption programs as possible so that you can take advantage of strong encryption, keep it strong, keep it safe, and make sure that we win Crypto Wars Part 2. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. We now have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So please just line up at the microphones. Or of course, if you're on the internet, use ISC or Twitter to also ask questions. And we'll just, and if you're leaving, uh, please be quiet. Stay out of the line of sight of the cameras. Just try to be, uh, just don't leave maybe, but be quiet if you do. And now microphone number one, please. I happened to, to stumble upon the, the scorecard once and, uh, and WhatsApp was marked with a lot of green checkboxes. Okay. Um, how much can we trust WhatsApp, especially in the terms of it being a, a really high value target uh, since so many people are using it? Uh, so WhatsApp, yeah, it's indeed a, a high value target. I think they have, uh, I think as we're saying, uh, uh, over a billion users. Uh, for a long time, they, they were not having uh, strong encryption. They started to work with uh, uh, Open Whisper Systems and uh, Moxie Marlin Spike to increase the encryption right around the time that they uh, were being absorbed into Facebook. Um, so I, I think they are making efforts to uh, increase the encryption, have it, have it be uh, good. Um, though I would say the secure uh, messaging scorecard, um, I think this is true actually of a number of our rating things, it, it does rely upon public information that's available about it. We don't have the ability to, to sort of go in there and see if something secret has happened, to look through the, to, to, unless it's open source code, we can't look through the code. So it's based upon the information that is available. Uh, so I, I am hopeful that, that they are looking at that, but uh, uh, only they can, can guarantee. Uh, so, um, sorry, small follow-up. Um, so you did, not talk to the internal auditors that happen to have a look at the source code. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And now a question from the internet, please. Thank you. Um, are we facing a future where encryption is totally prohibited by law? And why is it um, not today? So is it because the agency are still able to obtain the data? So uh, are we facing a future in which encryption will be prohibited? No, not yet. Uh, and I hope not ever. Uh, we, we won the first uh, crypto wars, and I think we can win this one. We can show them both through, through reason, through, uh, through principle, through rhetoric, why banning encryption, having a world without a strong encryption is a terrible idea, and we will fight to maintain that as long as we can, and even if some jurisdictions do uh, pass laws that ban encryption, encryption will still be out there, be available from other sites, so I think that we can win this war. Um, microphone number two, please. Oh, hi, my name is Matthew, and, and this should not be intended to be the troll question, but uh, what is your honest opinion about the homebrewed crypto? Uh, so my opinion about homebrew crypto. Uh, well, one thing I, I think uh, uh, Bruce Schneier ha ha has said is that anybody can create a crypto system that they themselves cannot break. Um, so, I mean, th this is not to say that someone can't come up with, with, with a, uh, a good idea, uh, but before you can put much uh, uh, trust into these things, it has to be peer-reviewed, it has to be made available, get uh, world-class cryptographers to attack it, find the flaws, uh, improve it based upon those flaws. 
uh, and uh, see if you can do better. So, you know, if, if somebody has a better, uh, a better crypto system, uh, the only way we're going to know is if it is heavily tested, heavily vetted, and not put out there until everybody can look at it, attack it, and fail to break it. But what if the crypto is using just only the, some private circle of people? If the crypto is only... Sorry, some, I didn't some for, for some, some for, for a small group of people? I would still rely upon publicly vetted crypto programs. And if you're, uh, if you're creating an application that uses crypto, you should not only use a, a, a crypto program that has been tested, explain why you're choosing that one, have some, some uh, thought into it so people can understand that decision-making process and make sure they're making their decision about whether to use it based upon it. Okay, thanks. Number five, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Matthias. I'm on the board of Reporters Without Borders Germany. And in case you don't know here, we are suing the BND because we think that uh, what they're doing in collecting data and uh, analyzing them is uh, out of proportion, breaking the law and probably even the constitution. So right. thank I think, you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I gave that little intro because I have a question that might not be so popular here in this room. Um, if you assume that your conclusions and your propositions are correct, and I think they are, then um, we have to assume that we need strong crypto. If we at the same time assume end-to-end uh, -end encryption, if we at the same time assume that uh, law enforcement and police have to have some way to go after the bad guys, uh, what's the consequence? Does that mean that uh, you are in favor of giving law enforcement the ability, for example, to use uh, Trojan horses or other kinds of technologies to put them on people's computers because we can assume that the bad guys are not just um, doing phone calls over uh, uh, regular phone lines nowadays? Or if you don't think that this is um, uh, proportionate or the way to go, then what is? Well, um Thank, thank you for that question. Um, what, uh, what we've done with, at EFF with, with ourselves, actually, a number of other organizations, is we've cam come up with the necessary and proportionate principles. You go to necessaryandproportionate.org to see them. There are 13 principles for government surveillance in order to balance the, the needs of the state against human rights principles. So when they can go forward, I mean, the, there's 13 principles. Uh, it, it's a bit much to go through right now, but the, the gist of it is that we want to make sure that it's only when it is necessary and the uh, amount uh, that the governments are be allowed to do is proportionate to the crime that they're investigating, the, the act that they're, they're investigating, so that whether they may use a particular tool would be dependent upon the circumstances and always with uh, court oversight, making sure that it is done in accordance with law, in accordance with these principles. So I encourage you to check out necessaryandproportionate.org. Thanks. And, and now, the internet, please. Are there any documents uh, at EFF about QFIRE? And Jacob talked about a while ago. About QFIRE? A validation software? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Well, that was quick. Number four, please. I uh, really like the overview of arguments you uh, you gave. I've I discussed these matters uh, often with a wide range of people in the past few months. Um, and one of the arguments that you have not actively or directly refuted is that, um, well, we have wiretapping laws for phone conversations. And um, could they not just uh, analogously hold for digital communication in a more broad sense? What we, would be your response to such an argument? I, mean, I think that there's actually less and less of a difference between phone conversations and, and electronic communications. In fact, these days, many phone conversations are actually going over uh, voice over IP. They're, they're being transited the same way as, as an electronic uh, uh, communication. Um, and so, I mean, and, and many countries actually have brought these things together and applied some of the wiretapping rules to voice over uh, IP, even though it, it goes over a different, uh, different network. Uh, the, you know, the important thing, the principles behind this, is to make sure that 
they are getting access to uh, the content of communications only in accordance to law with a high standard. Have, you know, come back with a warrant. Make sure that before you get access to, to voice communications or written communications, you are meeting the highest possible test to make sure that this is something that is necessary and proportionate to the uh, investigation. So uh, the reason I bring this up is because often it's not allowed to um, construct uh, telecommunications network in such a way that it's not possible to wiretap the plain conversation going on. And this is in some sense analogous to what you're discussing here. It is. I mean, I think, you know, in the United States we have the Computer Assistance to the Law Enforcement Act, CALEA, it was actually passed in the 90s. Uh, it exempted the, the internet, but for voice communications uh, required to have uh, uh, some, some access to these, uh, to these communications. Uh, and so, uh, I don't think we should move that beyond that. I thought we actually, you know, I, I think that was a terrible idea in the beginning. Um, and uh, this still does not prevent you from using end-to-end -end encryption. It's just that people don't really uh, have uh, easy technologies if you're using a plain old telephone system to have an encrypted communication. But if you use uh, a voice over RP application, for example, if you use uh, Signal, you can have an end-to-end -end encrypted voice communication so that even if they have a uh, wiretap compliant network, they're still just going to get the encrypted uh, information that was going through. So end-to-end -end encryption is, is, the, is the better solution for the end user. And we're out of time. Please thank Kurt again. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>